Once upon a time, there lived a poor old woman, and she had a cat. The cat was so greedy that he poked his nose into every jug and jar. Then the day came when the old woman could not stand the cat's greedy ways any longer, and she said to him, Get out of my house. You may go wherever you like but never darken my door again. So the greedy cat was forced to go out into the wide world. The cat walked until he came to a bridge where he sat and gave a sad meow. And as he sat, he caught sight of a fox sitting nearby. The cat prowled slowly around the fox and rustled the bushes. The fox was terrified as he had never seen a cat before and the cat was terrified because he had never seen a fox before so they both just stood there shaking. Which of us should be in charge? What? You don't know who I am. I'm King Kitty. All the animals are afraid of me. Oh, I am ashamed to say that I have never heard of you before, the fox confessed and immediately invited King Kitty to his humble home for a sumptuous supper of chicken, duck, goose, and anything else he could find. Please eat more, Your Majesty. Make yourself at home. When the feast was finished, the fox prepared an exceptionally soft bed for King Kitty, who ordered complete silence while he had his royal nap. Get away from here! Don't you know that King Kitty is sleeping in my house? If you wake him now, he's sure to have you executed. Where are you running to? Are the hounds on your tail? Don't ask me, Bear. I was passing Fox's house and he told me to run away because King Kitty sleeps within and if I woke him, he'd have me executed. Hmm, the bear pondered. I have travelled to many lands, but I have never heard of such a feline figure. I shall pay a visit to the fox and see this King Kitty for myself. Oh, Bear, please don't go there, because if you wake King Kitty, he'll have you executed and me along with you. This frightened the bear, who ran and ran until he reached the rabbit. Oh, my, what will happen if King Kitty wakes up and walks out into the forest? I've got a splendid idea. Let's all invite King Kitty to a banquet. If you trust me, I'll go to the fox and invite his majesty. All right, I'll go to see if King Kitty is awake and I'll inform him of your wish. Majesty, a crow has arrived sent by the animals of the forest to invite you to a royal banquet. King Kitty brushed his white whiskers and said, Very well, you may go and tell the crow I will attend. A 
As evening came, King Kitty began to make himself ready. He waxed his whiskers and left in the company of his host, the fox. The crow met them to show the way. But the crow was too scared to fly down to the ground, and so instead he flew from tree to tree and called, This way, please! This way, please! The other animals soon sighted King Kitty arriving with the fox. Oh, dearie me! Here comes King Kitty! He'll skewer me on his spiky whiskers! But all of a sudden, the animals took fright and fled to all four corners of the forest. And if these foolish animals had not run away, my story would have lasted longer still. Hungarian Folk Tales The Salt Princess Once upon a time there lived an old king who had three beautiful daughters. The old king wanted to find husbands for his daughters before he died, but he could not decide which daughter should receive the most beautiful of his three kingdoms. So he decided to give his most beautiful kingdom to the daughter who loved him the most. The old king asked his daughters, and the eldest replied, I love you, dear father, as a dove loves good grain. What about you, child? I love you, dear father, as a hot summer day loves a cool breeze. And what about you, daughter? I love you, dear father, like people love salt. What do you mean, salt? You ungrateful child. Is this what I raised and loved you for all these years? Get out of here. Get out of my sight. His daughter tried to explain that people love salt very much indeed. She sobbed and begged, but her father shunned her from his palace. The poor princess walked and walked. She was terribly sad. She walked until she reached a vast forest. There she found a large hollow tree and she hid herself inside it. She lived by gathering delicious nuts and ripe berries from the green forest. One day, the prince from the neighbouring kingdom was out hunting when he happened to pass by. He was chasing a deer when he spotted the princess. But when she saw the prince, she hid in her hollow tree. The handsome prince soon found the tree and shouted into the hollow, Who is in there? But the princess refused to reply. Who is in there? Speak up. Speak up or I'll shoot. The terrified princess eventually appeared. She was so beautiful, but she could not stop crying. The prince was so overcome that he embraced the sad princess, sat her high on his horse and took her home to his palace. The 
Their wedding was so grand that even the dogs ate beef broth. And the young couple lived as happily as two doves. Time passed until the young king asked his bride one day, Tell me, why did your father chase you away? Because I told him that I loved him like people love salt. Why is that all? Then the young king had an idea and sent a letter to the old king, inviting him to come and visit. The old king came the very next day in a golden carriage. The young king led him to his grandest chamber and sat him down at the table. His servant served soup, but it had no salt in it. And the meat had no flavour either. The king ate a great deal but was still left feeling hungry. He remained silent for a while, but eventually had to speak. What kind of cook do you have, son? Who makes food with no salt? I heard you don't like salt, sire. Who told you that? Why, your daughter, of course. Then the princess appeared. The king's daughter smiled at her old father, who shed tears of joy. Father and daughter embraced, and the king gave his most beautiful kingdom to his youngest daughter. And they all lived happily ever after. Once upon a time, there lived a wily fox. The old fox was hungry, and so he took a sack and left his home. He walked and walked until the sky grew dark, and he stood outside the house of a rich farmer. He knocked hard on the door, and when asked who was there, he replied, I'm a poor traveller, in need of shelter for the night. Will you take pity on me? The rich farmer had a good heart, and so did his wife. They let the fox come in and offered him supper. Kind sir, are there no thieves around the house? I have a fine fat cockerel in my sack and I wouldn't like to have it taken in the night. Worry not, Mr Fox. Nothing has been stolen in my house. You can sleep in peace. cockerel has been stolen. They all searched high and low, but no one could find the cockerel anywhere. The rich farmer was so ashamed that a guest of his had been robbed, and he felt sorry for the old fox as it wailed and moaned. But what could he do? He gave the fox a fine fat cockerel of his own and wished him well. So the fox left with a grateful grin on his whiskered face. 
He walked and walked until the sky grew dark and knocked hard on the door of a second farm. Good people lived in this house and he was welcomed once more. As they were about to go to bed, the fox began to scour the room as if searching for thieves. Kind sir, let me tell you that I have a fine fat goose in my sack and I wouldn't like it to be stolen in the night. Worry not, Mr Fox. Nothing has been stolen in my house. You can sleep in peace. The fox waited for these fine folk to fall asleep and he opened the sack. And what was in the sack? Why, the cockerel, of course. He took the fat fowl out and ate it all up, feathers and all. Oh, poor me, my fine fat goose has been stolen. They all searched high and low, but no one could find the goose anywhere. The farmer then gave the old fox a fine fat goose of his own to stop him crying and moaning so. He walked and walked until the sky grew dark and he stood outside a third house. He knocked again, was let in again, but before they went to bed, he turned to the farmer and said, I've put my sack here under the bench, kind sir, but I can't rest in my bed because I should tell you, kind sir, that I have got a fine fat piglet in it. You can sleep in peace, Mr Fox, the farmer assured him. No matter what is in your sack, there will be no trouble here. Oh, poor me, my fine fat piglet has been stolen. They all searched high and low, but no one could find the piglet anywhere. What else could the farmer do but give the fox a fine fat piglet of his own? When the sky grew dark that night, the fox knocked at another door. They let him in and again he said the same before they went to sleep. Kind sir, please look out for thieves this night, for I have a fine fat pig in my sack and I wouldn't like it to be stolen. The farmer glanced at the sack and saw that it had no fine fat pig inside and knew from its squeals that it was only a piglet. But the wily fox didn't go to sleep. He ate the piglet up, curly tail and all. As soon as the sun rose, the fox began to moan, Oh poor me! My fine fat pig has been stolen. The farmer immediately saw the trick and pretended to feel sorry for the old fox. Don't be so sad and don't wake the village with your moaning. I'll give you two fat pigs instead of one. Give me your sack so I can put them into it outside. The master went outside with the sack. He had two hungry foxhounds. He put them into the fox's sack, tied it up, gave it to the fox and wished him well. When the wily old fox opened the sack, he saw no pigs. A watcher jump out of the sack, but the two hungry foxhounds. The fox ran as fast as his red legs could carry him. He forgot about his belly and wanted to save his furry hide. But the hungry foxhounds caught hold of his tail and tore him to shreds. If they hadn't, my story would never end. Hungarian Folk Tales The 
Little Pig and the Wolves Once upon a time, there was a little pig who lived in a little house in the middle of a vast forest. The little pig was cooking supper one day when a scruffy wolf knocked on his door. Little pig, let me in. It's so cold out here, I'll freeze to death. No, I won't let you in because you'll eat me up. Just let my back leg in or I'll freeze to death. The little pig put a big pot of water to boil on the fire and then he let the wolf's back leg into the house. let my other back leg in too. <coughs> Little pig, please let my two front feet in now. The little pig let the wolf's two front feet in, but the scruffy wolf still wasn't happy. <laughs> little pig, please let all of me in, and I promise I won't hurt a hair on your head. The little pig found a sack and held it open so that the wolf would walk right into it. And that's what he did. The little pig wasted no time and tied the sack up in a flash. Then he took the pot off the fire and poured boiling water all over the wolf. The steaming hot water made the wolf shout and he wriggled and jiggled until he pushed the sack open. The bold scolded wolf jumped out of the sack and saw the little pig sitting at the top of the tree. And the wolf ran off to find help. scolded wolf eventually returned with the other wolves. The wolves thought and thought about how they would catch the little pig as none of them could climb a tree. At long last they decided to stand on one another's shoulders until they reached the little pig. The wolves climbed quickly one on top of the other. The bold scolded wolf stayed at the bottom because he was afraid of heights, so the others all climbed on top of him. The tower of wolves reached up to the sky until they only needed one more wolf on the top. The last wolf started to climb. 
and the little pig shouted, Pour hot water on the bold one! The bold scolded wolf leapt out from the bottom of the pile and ran as fast as his legs could carry him. The wolves tumbled to the ground in a heap of furry bones. Then all the little piglet had to do was to jump down from the tree and go back into his little house. And the bad wolves never dared come near again. Once upon a time, there lived a man who had a pig. The pig grew very big and fat, so the man decided to slaughter it for food. By the time spring came, the man and his family had eaten everything but the pork pudding. One day, the man went to tend his vines while his wife and three daughters stayed at home to cook supper. The wife told the eldest daughter, Go up into the attic and fetch the pork pudding, my girl, and we'll cook it for your father's supper. The eldest girl did as she was told and was about to cut the pork pudding down when it spoke to her. What do you want? You won't eat me, because I'll eat you first. And with these words, it ate the girl up. The wife could not imagine why her daughter had not come back down with the pork pudding. So she sent the second eldest daughter up to the attic to fetch it. But the fat pork pudding ate the second daughter up as well. So the wife sent the youngest girl up to fetch the pork pudding. But the youngest daughter did no better than her sisters and the bulging pork pudding ate her up too. The wife could not imagine what had happened to her three darling daughters. Well, I shall see for myself, she said, and went up into the roof. When she saw the size of the enormous pork pudding, she was pleased. But when she tried to cut the pork pudding down, it ate her up in a single mouthful. That evening, the man returned home from his vines to find no one at home to cook his supper. There was no supper on the stove and not even a fire inside it. The man searched high and low for his wife and three daughters. He realised that he would go hungry, so he went up to the attic to fetch the pork pudding to eat for his supper. 
But when the man got up into the attic and tried to cut the round pork pudding down, it shouted at him like it had at the others. You won't eat me, I'll eat you first. And without any ado, the pork pudding ate the man up. By now, the heavy pork pudding was so weighty that the string could no longer hold it. It fell from the beam, rolled down the ladder, onto the porch and out into the garden. The little house was on a big hill, so the gigantic pork pudding rolled all the way down the street. The local folks were just coming back from the fields and the massive pork pudding ate them all up. The roly-poly pork pudding met a herd of pigs at the edge of the village, being led by a swine herd eating bacon with a pocket knife. The preposterously large pork pudding ate all the pigs up and then the swine herd too. But the pocket knife was open and the swine herd cut his way out of the pork pudding and everybody followed him out into the sunshine. If that pork pudding had not split as it did, my story would have never ended. and the wolf were not the best of friends. The fox had tricked the wolf too many times. And so the wolf decided it was time to eat the fox. One day, 12 carts full of fish came trundling down the road. The fox stole a stack of fish from one of them. The wolf went to the fox's hole and shouted in, you know, Brother Fox, I'm going to eat you now because you have cheated me so many times. Then he saw the pile of fish. But give me some of that fish first, Brother Fox. All right, I'll give you a couple. And the fox gave him some. Where did you catch these, Brother Fox? In the river, Brother Wolf. Well, teach me how to catch some too. All right, Brother Wolf, I'll teach you. So they both went out onto the frozen river and cut a hole in the ice. Well, Brother Fox, put your tail in here and wait until the fish begin to bite. You need to wait until it gets good and heavy. And that's exactly what happened. The fox left the wolf behind. The wolf tried his tail a couple of times, but it was still too light. And he said, there still aren't enough fish on the end. So he kept his tail dipped in the water, but then his tail froze fast and he tried to pull it out, but he couldn't. When the women went down to the river the next morning, they saw the wolf and they beat him with big sticks. The wolf leapt about until his tail tore off 
and he ran away in anger. Then the wolf met the fox again. Now I'm going to eat you, brother fox, because you cheated me again. And you can see that I've lost my tail. Why did you keep it in for so long? Were there so many fish on the end that you couldn't pull it out, you foolish wolf? Why did you do it? You know, brother wolf, I happen to know about a wedding party in the village. Let's go together and have some fun. And the silly wolf believed what the fox told him. The fox and the wolf went to the wedding party that evening. The farmer had left the barn door open. The fox said, Don't make any noise, because the people at the party will hear you and kill you. They both started to eat. The fox began to feel very merry, and so he said to the wolf, Brother wolf, I want to sing a jolly song. The wolf said, Don't, or else we shall be killed. Go to the top of the cellar and sing there. The fox started to sing so loudly that all the people came out from the party. They beat the wolf so badly that he barely survived. The fox had a brilliant idea and rolled in tar in the hen's trough. The tar froze on the fox and looked just like bone sticking out of his skin. Then he went to the road where he knew the wolf would pass. He lay in his way and started to groan and moan in pain. The wolf eventually hobbled by. Now I'm definitely going to eat you up, Brother Fox. Brother Fox, you had me badly beaten, although I told you not to sing. Your problem is less than mine, Brother Wolf. You know what, Brother Fox? Sit on my back. And they walked like this for a while until the fox said, The beaten one carries the unbeaten one, the unbroken one carries the broken one. Excuse me, what was that you said, Brother Fox? I am fighting to stay alive, Brother Wolf. I don't know who will look after my children when I'm gone. They carried on walking like this for a while until the fox said again, The beaten one carries the unbeaten one, he carries the unbroken. What was that again, Brother Fox? I'm fighting to stay alive, Brother Wolf. I don't know who will look after my children when I'm gone. Then the fox started again. The beaten one carries the unbeaten one. What are you going on about again, Brother Fox? I'm fighting to stay alive, Brother Wolf. I don't know who will look after my children when I'm gone. Then the fox leapt into his hole, but the wolf caught the fox's foot. You did not catch my foot, Brother Fox. It's the tree root. The wolf let the foot go and then caught the root. I won't budge from your hole until you come out and then I will eat you. But the fox could make do with the fish he had. The wolf got very hungry and left the fox's house. And he has been roaming the forest ever since. Once upon a time, there lived a king, and the king had three sons. All three princes were of marrying age, and so their father told them to find themselves wives. He threw three sticks in the air, one for each son, and said, Wherever your stick falls is where you find your bride. The eldest son's stick fell towards a young baroness. The middle son's stick fell towards a young countess. While the youngest son's stick 
fell towards the dark forest. The young men all left the palace, but the youngest one was very sad. He had no idea how he would find a bride in the thick forest. And as he was walking in the forest, he met a small pussycat that walked behind him. The young prince spoke to the pussycat and said, My royal father told me to travel to these parts where I would find my bride, but I can't see a girl anywhere near. Don't worry, I will marry you. The prince could not return home until he promised to marry the pussycat. The other princes had already arrived back and their father asked them each what they thought of their bride. The eldest one said that he found a baroness and the middle son said that he found a countess, while the youngest one asked them to wait and see. Then the king ordered all the three grooms to fetch a beautiful bouquet from their beloved. The two elder ones went happily, but the youngest one was very sad. When he reached the edge of the forest, the pussycat was already waiting for him. My dear betrothed, you look so unhappy. Tell me, why are you so sad? How wouldn't I be sad when my royal father has ordered us all to bring a bouquet from our fiancés? Now what could I bring from a pussycat? Don't worry, just lie down and take a rest. Then the pussycat scratched a tree and many more pussycats appeared. One of them brought silver flowers, another golden flowers, and a third brought diamond flowers, and the bride arranged them all in a beautiful bouquet. The other two princes were already at home when the young prince arrived late. The king said that the bouquets were truly beautiful, but the most beautiful of all belonged to the youngest son. They all asked him to tell the name of his bride-to-be, but he asked them to wait and see. Days passed and soon became a week, when the king ordered his sons to go to their brides and fetch a handkerchief each. The young princes all left, but the youngest one was very sad. By the time he reached the edge of the forest, the pussycat was already waiting for him. My dear betrothed, you look so unhappy. Tell me, why are you so sad? How wouldn't I be sad when my royal father has ordered us all to bring a handkerchief from our fiancés? But a pussycat cannot weave. Don't worry, just lie down and take a rest. The pussycat scratched the tree and once again more pussycats appeared. One brought silver yarn, another brought golden yarn, and a third gave diamond yarn, and the pussycat bride wove them together. When he arrived at the palace, the king inspected all three handkerchiefs. He told the eldest boys that theirs were quite pretty, but he told the youngest son that his was the prettiest of all. Weeks passed and soon became a month, when the king told his sons to bring their fiancés to the palace. The two elder boys went happily for their spouses, while the youngest one became sadder than ever before. How could he possibly take the pussycat home? His pussycat bride was already waiting for him at the edge of the forest. My dear betrothed, you look so unhappy. Tell me why are you so sad? How wouldn't I be sad when my royal father has ordered us all to fetch our brides? Now how can I present a pussycat at the palace? Don't worry, just lie down and take a rest. The youngest prince thought he would never sleep, but at last he succumbed and fell into a slumber. When he awoke, he was very worried, but the young princess told him it was she in the guise of a pussycat whom he had betrothed but she had been under a curse to live like that until a young man asked for her hand in marriage. I was a pussycat and you asked me to marry you, so I turned back into a princess. A wonderful coach awaited them with proud coachmen and fine horses, 
So the prince sat in the carriage with his princess and travelled back to the palace in regal style. The wedding party was already underway at the palace when the guards came to the king and told him that a king had arrived from another country. When the young couple arrived, the king soon saw that they were his son and his beautiful bride. They were all amazed to discover that the youngest prince's bride was the most beautiful of them all. Then they all sang and danced and danced and sang until the wedding party was done. And this is where my story ends. Don't eat the spoon. Once upon a time, beyond the snowy Alps, in the cradle of the Carpathian Mountains, lay the land of Hungary, and there lived a king called Matthias. If the old stories are to be believed, then King Matthias liked to see for himself how his people lived. He dressed in the clothes of a simple beggar and wandered the land, where he spoke to his people as their equal. One day he found himself on a vast plain where all he could see was the small house of a shepherd. So King Matthias approached the house and greeted the good shepherd. It was the middle of winter, so the shepherd invited the king into his home. The shepherd had no idea that this poor beggar was actually the king of the land. He gave him food for his journey and the king carved his host's name on his stick before he returned to his royal palace. The shepherd had a trusty black sheep dog. The little dog was so skilled and loyal that it never left the shepherd's feet. King Matthias sent a letter to the shepherd inviting him and his trusty sheep dog to the palace. But the invitation did not explain why he was invited or how to find the king's home. So the shepherd made himself look smart, took his crook in his hand and set off for the king's royal palace with his sheepdog by his side. When they reached the city gate, they were met by a guard who said, Hey, old man, stop here. Where are you going? To his majesty the king. And with a dog? But of course, the shepherd replied, here you are, you can see the royal letter that invites us both. The guard read the letter from top to bottom. Oh, old man, you are sure to be richly rewarded by the king. I shall let you pass if you promise to share the great reward with me. Well, I don't mind. I promise you that half of the reward will be yours. Then the shepherd reached the castle gate. He tried to enter, but was again stopped by a guard. Hey, old man, stop here. Where are you going? To his majesty the king. With a dog? Well, I have a letter. Here you are. You were right. You were both invited. But then the guard remembered that there was a banquet inside the palace. The king had called together all the important men in his kingdom. The king obviously wanted to reward the lowly shepherd in front of these rich men, but also planned to play a joke on the old man first. The second guard said, Old man, you are going to get a great reward. I shall let you pass if you give me half of that reward. All right. I will give you half of it. So he would give one half to this one, and he had promised to give the other half to the other one, so that would leave him with nothing, wouldn't it? The old shepherd walked into the palace. 
The king and his courtiers were already seated around the large table. The servants had set places for them all with a bowl, spoon, knife and a fork in front of everyone except the shepherd, who had been given no spoon. The soup was served and everyone helped himself. The first, of course, was His Majesty, King Matthias, who raised his spoon and said, Dear sirs, only donkeys don't eat soup. Everyone took his spoon. The shepherd tried to take his one too, but he had none. Oh dear, I shall be the donkey now because I cannot eat my soup. I cannot eat soup with either a fork or a knife. But this was not the first time that a poor man had to eat soup without a spoon. The old shepherd simply cut the end off his bread and hollowed it out. The crispy crust made the perfect spoon for eating soup and he sat and ate every last drop, watched by all the important guests and the king. Your Majesty said that only donkeys don't eat soup. Well, let me add that only donkeys don't eat their spoon. And the old shepherd gobbled up his soup-soaked spoon in one. <laughs> the banquet eventually ended and the time came for the king to hand out rewards. And you will never believe what the old shepherd asked for. Your Majesty, I would like 50 strokes of the stick. Shepherd, I haven't invited you to beat you 50 times with a stick. I wanted to play a practical joke on you, but you played the joke on me. Therefore, you deserve more than 50 strokes. Tell me now what I owe you. Your Majesty, you owe me nothing more than 50 strokes. That's all I want. Then the king understood that it had been a joke again. Very well then, but tell me now why. Why? The reason is very simple. On my way here, I was stopped by a guard at the city gate who refused to let me in unless he could share half of my reward. Then a second guard only let me enter the palace if he too could receive half of my reward. So now one will receive 25 strokes of the stick and so will the second. And so the shepherd's joke was ended. Once upon a time, in a land far, far away, there stood a large farm. A family lived on that farm with a husband, a wife, a son and a daughter. When his wife died, the husband married again, so that there should be someone to bring up the children. But the new wife did not like the children and she put poison in their food. When the children sat down to eat their supper, a white dove flew down and said, Children, don't eat the soup because it's poisoned. Run away from home and never look back. The boy and his young sister walked and walked until they heard someone calling. Green Peter, Green Peter, come here. It was a poor little fish cast ashore by the sea. Pick me up, Green Peter, throw me back into the water, do good and you will prosper. So the boy happily helped the little fish. They walked and walked until they heard someone calling. Green Peter, Green Peter, come here. This time it was a little bird that had lost its flock. The bird begged the boy, Green Peter, please put me on the branch so that I can fly on with my bird brothers. Green Peter put it up on the branch and the little bird said to him, Thank you, do good and you will prosper. 
They walked and walked until they heard someone calling, Green Peter, come here. A poor shriveled rosebush was calling. It begged the boy to water its roots. Well, Green Peter, the rosebush said, do good and you will prosper. Green Peter and his sister walked until they came to the town. When he reached the gate, the people called out to him, Come in, Green Peter, come in, because there are already 99 heads on stakes and yours will be the 100th one. Even though Green Peter was afraid, he went in all the same. And he was told that the princess would marry the first man who could hide himself so well that she would never find him. So Green Peter went in and was ordered to hide himself three mornings running, because otherwise he would be beheaded. But if the princess failed to find him, she and half the kingdom would be his. Poor Peter wept and wept and said to himself, I've just managed to get away from my evil stepmother and look what trouble I'm in again. Where could I possibly hide? Suddenly the little fish appeared. Why are you crying, Green Peter? Because the king said that unless I can hide from his daughter, he will have me beheaded. The fish opened its mouth and said, Hide in here, Green Peter. So Green Peter slipped into the fish's mouth and it swam to the bottom of the deep sea where it hid itself in the sand. The young princess stepped out into the corridor. She rubbed her eyes and said, Come out, Green Peter, from the mouth of the fish, from the sand at the bottom of the sea. So Green Peter came out. He crawled sadly out of the mouth of the fish and went to the royal palace. The next morning he tried again. Where, oh where, shall I hide? Suddenly the little bird flew down and said to him, Why are you crying, Green Peter? Why indeed, if I don't manage to hide from the princess, I'll be beheaded. The little bird spread its wings and said, Come on, hide beneath my wings. And it flew up behind the back of the sun. When the princess came out to the corridor, she rubbed her eyes and caught sight of him at once. Green Peter, come out from behind the back of the sun, from beneath the bird's wings. The bird flew down to the ground and let Green Peter slip out from under its wings. Green Peter went sadly back and next morning he again set out. But by now he was crying more than ever before. Oh, 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 what will become of me? The rosebush came up to him and said, Don't worry, I'm going to hide you. They went before the royal palace and stopped right in front of the corridor. The rosebush sat down and said, Hide among my leaves and thorns. And it opened up so that it became more radiant than the sun itself. The princess came out. She rubbed her eyes, but she couldn't see Green Peter anywhere. Rub your eyes again, my girl, said the king. Or would you prefer to marry? Again the princess rubbed her eyes, she looked and looked but to no avail. She eventually grew tired of looking for the lad and called out to him, Come out Green Peter, come out from wherever you are, I can't see you anywhere. And so Green Peter came out at last. The young couple married right away. He got half the kingdom too and the wedding feast lasted for three long days. I was there myself and I had a fine time. I was even given a nice big bone to chew. Once upon a time there was a large farm and on that farm lived a man who had relatives from another village who came to visit him one day. They did not want to arrive empty-handed 
so they brought him a gift of honey. The honey was quickly eaten with big chunks of fresh bread and was soon all gone. But while they sat eating, they discussed what a fine thing it was to keep bees and how simple it was with such rich rewards. The man could hardly wait for the next farm gathering where he suggested they should buy bees to make honey. The head farmer agreed and asked if there was anyone willing to work with bees. A man stood up and said he knew all there was to know about bees. He also told them that he knew where to buy bees if that was what they wanted and everyone cheered with joy. They worked out how much money to give the man and he set off to buy bees for the farm. He bought as many hives as he could put on a train. Then he had the whole car covered in red cloth and had red clothes and a red hat made to wear. He soon made friends with the bees and spoke to them. He opened the door and the bees came and went as they pleased. When they were halfway back to the farm, the train drove into a side track and the engine left. So the man asked the station master, why has the engine gone? Because, the station master said, it was ordered to leave. How long will the train be in the station? Who am I to know that? Don't talk to me like that kind, sir, because if I know that the train will be staying here for a whole day long, then I will let my bees out so they can have some air and food. The train will remain for at least three days more, the station master told him. The beekeeper went out and opened up the hives. Come out, come out, children, and have some air. Find food for yourselves and return to your hives in time for the sunset. The bees had barely left when suddenly the station master had an order to start the train again. The beekeeper saw from the top of the carriage that the engine was coming and the train was hooked up. And they sat waiting for the station master's signal to start. The beekeeper ran to complain. What is all of this? You never told me about this station master, but I received an order to start the train. But that's impossible. My bees are still in the field. They cost a fortune. What am I to do with your bees? The station master replied. I am a station master and not a beekeeper. Well, at least leave the carriage with the bees here in the station so it can be coupled up with another train tomorrow. That's impossible. And with these words, he started the train, which left the station with the bees' carriage. The beekeeper also left in his red clothes. While most of the bees were busy gathering honey, they sent a small party back to see if all was safe with their carriage in the station. Well, when they arrived, they saw that the train had taken their hives away. They returned to the meadow and told the others that their carriage had vanished. So all of the bees flew back to the station and when they arrived, they found people waiting for a passenger train. Well, the bees thought that these people had stolen their hives and so they stung them and stung them. The people cried out for help. The station master heard their calls, so he rushed out of his office and he too was attacked by the angry swarm. His wife heard his cries and opened the window to see what was wrong. And as she opened the window, the bees rushed in and stung her so badly that she cried louder than all the rest. The station master heard this and he ran upstairs to find out what had happened to his wife. And then he saw that the whole room was filled with bees. The two of them had to hide under a blanket to save their skins, but both were badly stung and their faces sadly swollen. The people waiting for the train all ran back to their homes, but the swarm of bees flew after them. The other villagers heard their shouts and ran out into the street. Help! The village is being attacked by bees! And they rang the big bell. The station master eventually came to his senses and he called for the train to be sent back to the station and it soon reappeared on the platform. The beekeeper, still dressed all in red, climbed on top of the carriage and started to call the bees back. Come on children, your hives are here. The bees, hearing their master's voice, gathered together and flew back in an orderly fashion. Those that had survived the bloody battle made their way quietly back into their hives. Then the beekeeper went to see the station master, but he could hardly recognise him. 
You deserved whatever happened because you spoke to me so rudely. But the beekeeper eventually forgave the station master and the beekeeper went back to the farm and laughed when he recalled what had happened that day. The bees soon started to make honey on the farm and made more money than all the farmers and animals put together. From then on, life on the farm was sweet. Once upon a time, many years ago, there was a poor woman, and she had a son and a little cow. They had no food at home, and so the mother told her son, Go, son, drive the cow to market, but be sure to get a good price for her. So the son took the cow to the market. He quickly found a buyer and exchanged the family cow for a single bean. The boy hurried home to show his mother what he had made at the market. The mother cried and cried when she learned that he had sold the cow for a single bean, but her son consoled her. Don't be sad, mother. The old man who bought the cow said that I should plant this bean today and wait to see what happens. So the young boy planted the bean under the window in the small garden, but he was so anxious to see what would become of the bean that he couldn't even eat his supper. He awoke the following day to discover that the bean had grown overnight. He looked out of the window, but he couldn't even see the top of the giant beanstalk. He thought he'd take a better look, so he walked out of the house and stared up at the sky. However hard he looked, he still couldn't see the top of the beanstalk, so the boy said to his mother, Well, mother, now you can see how much that bean was worth. I'm going to climb to the top to see how high it is. He climbed and climbed until the great height made him feel dizzy in the head. There was a hole in the clouds and the young boy peeped through and saw a spectacular house. He thought, I'm tired after climbing so I can stay here for the night and climb back down the beanstalk in the morning. He walked into the house and saw an old woman. The woman asked the boy, What are you doing here, my child? My husband is a dragon. He has three heads. If he sees you, he'll eat you up. The boy begged the woman to hide him because he was terribly afraid of the dragon. The woman asked him, Are you hungry, my child? Oh yes, I'm very hungry indeed. The woman immediately gave the boy some supper and he thanked her for her kindness. Come now, hide away at once as my husband is coming home. She brought a large bowl into the room and hid it underneath the bed. The little boy was very tired, but he was far too afraid to sleep. When the clock struck twelve, he heard a terrible rumbling and grumbling sound. The fierce dragon walked into the house carrying a black hen under his arm. He put it on the table and said, Lay an egg. And the black hen laid a golden egg. Then the dragon said again, Lay another, and the hen laid as many golden eggs as the dragon wanted. But the fearsome dragon was very hungry. Why, fetch my supper! And his wife brought the dragon a meal. 
the dragon ate all his supper up. When he'd eaten his supper, the dragon told his wife to fetch his hurdy-gurdy. <laughs> wife, is that a stranger I can smell in the house? Be calm, my dear. There is no stranger here. But there is. Bring him here or I'll tear you to pieces too. But the wife continued to calm her monstrous husband. The dragon played music until he fell asleep. He slept so peacefully that he didn't even snore. The wife thought it best to go to bed too, because it was almost dawn. When the boy saw that the dragon and his wife were fast asleep, he crept out from underneath the bowl and grabbed the black hen. He took the dragon's hurdy-gurdy and just before he disappeared back through the hole, he took a look back and saw that the dragon was running after him. So the young boy climbed quickly back down the giant beanstalk and grabbed a sharp axe. And he chopped the giant beanstalk down. The dragon fell to the ground and broke all his bones. Nobody had to be afraid of him anymore. Then he went to his mother, who was frightened by all the fighting. Don't be afraid, mother. We shall both have food from now on. How so, son? Then the son placed the hen on the table and stroked it, saying, Lay an egg. And the black hen laid a glorious golden egg, and it kept laying golden eggs until the mother and son were both rich. And the boy played beautiful music all day long to his mother's delight. And if you don't believe my story, you can go and see for yourself. Once upon a time, there lived a poor man who had so many children, they were like ants in a hill. The children often went without food for three days in a row. They were so very poor. So their father set off to find some food for his family. He was walking in the forest when the devil met him, disguised as a man. Where are you going, poor man? I'm going to find some food for my children. If I don't do something soon, they will all die of hunger. Don't take another step. I'll give you something that, if you use it wisely, will put an end to suffering in your house. Here, take this little walnut, give it any order you like, and it will be done without delay. But what am I to give you in return? I don't want anything much, only the thing you don't know about in your home. The poor man started thinking what it could be that he didn't know about, but he could not think of a single thing. And as times were hard, he gave his promise. The poor man arrived home with a little walnut and his wife asked, Have you brought food? We are also very, very hungry. Well, I didn't exactly bring food, but I did bring a peculiar nut. The man who gave it to me said that we can order it to do anything we desire and it will be done. Why did he give it to you? I'm sure he wanted something in return. All he said was that I am to give him what I don't know about in my home in return for the nut. Oh, you faithless fool, what have you done? You can see that I'm expecting a baby, and you didn't know about it, and now you have given it away. It's not my fault, wife, but what is done, is done. The poor man gave an order to the walnut. Well, little nut, all of us need food, drink and clothes. I order you to make them now. And everything the man asked for was provided and they all sat down to eat finer food than they had ever tasted in their lives before. The poor man also wanted a larger home, and so he ordered the little walnut to build him a large brick farmhouse. 
with green gardens, lush pastures and fine farm animals. The poor man soon became a rich man and his baby was born. The family were all working hard one day when two old men arrived and asked for shelter for the night. He was glad to help and also gave them food when they told him why they had come. We know that the devil is about to come and take your youngest child. We came to help you save your innocent babe. Do as we say and put a loaf of bread on your table at night and let it stay there until the following day. So the man put a loaf on the table and everyone in the house went to sleep for the night. They were all fast asleep at midnight when the devil appeared under the window and shouted up, Hey, master of the house, do you hear me? Do you remember your promise to me? Give it to me now, I came for that. Nobody heard his words as they were all sleeping, but instead the bread spoke up. Stay and sit easy outside, just wait as I waited. Be patient and suffer as I patiently waited. I was sown in the soil in the autumn and sat there all winter, as you must wait now. When spring came, I started to grow and I waited to grow tall, as you must wait now too. When the time of harvest came, I was cut with a scythe and gathered in bunches, but I had to suffer, as you must now suffer too. Then I was put on a cart, pushed along a road and into the village and waited, as you must wait now too. I was stamped on and painfully cracked. I had to suffer, as you must now suffer too. I was shoveled into a barn where they beat me with sticks. They beat me hard and I suffered as you must suffer now too. Then I was put in a sack, taken to the mill and poured between two heavy stones and ground to powder. I had to suffer as you must suffer now too. I was taken home and put into a bowl with salt and water. Then they punched me with their fists, kneaded me and tortured me. Then greatest of all pains in the world, they pushed me into a fiery oven. I had to suffer all of this, so you must suffer now too. They baked me and burned me before I was brought here, and cut me with a sharp metal knife. I had to be patient and suffer and wait. Now you must be patient and suffer and wait now too. The devil was sad to hear the sound of the cockerel heralding the dawn of the next day. He had no power over men in the bright light of morning, so he ran back to his distant home and the farmer's family kept their youngest son. The farmer thanked the old men for saving his baby boy from the devil's grasp. And that poor farmer still lives a wealthy life, unless they have lost their little walnut. There was once a poor cobbler who toiled all day and all night and had more children than there are holes in a sieve. One day he mended the shoes of a miller who paid him with flour and he was carrying the flour home when the wind blew all the flour away. Well, that's too much. I'll go and find the king of the winds to let him know it was heartless to take that sack of flour away from me. 
he made his way through many lands until he arrived at a beautiful meadow. There he saw a whirlwind approaching that blew the dust from the road up into a spiralling cloud. And the poor cobbler was so very afraid that he took his hat off and lay flat on the ground to save himself from the raging wind. You are wise to recognise and bow down before my power, said the king of the winds, or else you would have fared much worse. Tell me, what brings you to this distant place? I came for compensation from you, your majesty. The other day I was paid a sack of flour, and I was just carrying it home when a youthful breeze blew it clean out of my hands, and now my family have no food to eat. Leave that to me, that wicked wind will suffer for its deeds, but I will not let you suffer any longer. So the king led the poor cobbler into his palace, where he fed him and gave him a magical lamb. Then he said, when you arrive home, simply say, shake yourself, O lamb, and the lamb will shake off enough money to keep you for a month. But beware not to try this before you arrive home. The poor cobbler took leave from the king of the winds and left for home. But his curiosity overcame him and he simply had to see what the little lamb could do. As soon as he uttered the word of command, the ground around the lamb was showered with gold coins. He soon reached his lodgings for the night in the house of a very old friend and he warned his friend never to say, shake yourself, O lamb. But the poor cobbler had hardly fallen asleep when his host and his wife ordered the beast, Shake yourself, O lamb! When they saw the gold coins scatter on the ground, they took the animal and replaced it with a lamb from their own flock. The poor cobbler woke the next morning, but failed to notice the change. He thanked the man and his wife and left for home with high hopes in his heart. When he eventually arrived back, he said, Shake yourself, O lamb. He repeated the order a number of times, but the little lamb simply stood and stared back at him. The cobbler then set off again to visit the king of the winds, and he was very angry. He marched straight to the palace to voice his complaint. I am sure you did not take my advice, and you must have spoken to the lamb before you reached home. But this time, I will give you a tablecloth, and all you have to say is, Fill yourself with fine fare, O tablecloth, and it will be covered in food. But do not be tempted to try this before you arrive home. But the poor cobbler was too curious again, and he tried the tablecloth. When evening came, he took lodging with his friend again, and he said to him, you mustn't tell my tablecloth to fill itself with fine fare. The friend and his wife could hardly wait for the cobbler to sleep that night. They gave the order at once and when they found out what a valuable tablecloth he had, they exchanged it for one of their own. The next day he arrived home and became terribly angry when he ordered the tablecloth again and again, but nothing happened. Again, the poor cobbler travelled hastily back to see the King of the Winds, who was waiting for him when he arrived and presented him with a small cane. He told him he should not tell the cane to turn around cleverly, O cane, before he arrived home again. The poor cobbler could barely wait to find out what the cane would do, and so he quickly said, Turn around cleverly, O cane. The cane hopped up and began to beat him hard. The poor cobbler cried out in pain, Stop! And the clever cane stopped beating him at once. Now the poor cobbler knew what to do with the cane. On his way home, he stayed with his old friend again. He warned the man and his wife not to say, Turn around cleverly, O cane. But his wife's friend woke her husband at midnight. They took the cane into their room and she said, Turn around cleverly, O cane. Once for me and once for my husband. The poor cobbler was quickly woken by their cries. I told you not to address my cane, but it seems that you are the guilty one, so let it beat you as it will. Oh, we promise to return both the lamb and the tablecloth. 
Then the poor cobbler ordered the cane to stop. But the friend and his wife did not wait for the cane to beat them again, and they hurried forth with the poor cobbler's lamb and his tablecloth, who took them home to his family, who never wanted for money or food again. And they all lived happily ever after. <laughs>